day and welcome to another edition of Community Forum. My name is Joseph Feaster, the host of the program, and today we're going to be talking about a department in the city of Stoughton which is important to all of us. When you have a medical emergency, whether you have a pot that you left on the stove and now it's gotten into a big blaze, no, you're not going to just call anybody. You're going to call the Stoughton Fire Department. And my guests today are representatives of that department, and I'd like to introduce them to you. And they probably don't need introduction to most of you. But first and foremost, I'd like to introduce the Chief, Mark Doloff. Uh, he has been a firefighter for many, many years. He has uh, served as an EMS. He has served as a lieutenant. They saw his capabilities and uh, he became the deputy chief and then he was the interim chief and now he is the El Jefe of the Stoughton Fire Department and I'm happy to have him here. He has brought two of his colleagues with him as well, uh, Lieutenant Tim Carroll who is the EMS uh, uh, lieutenant and we will be talking about a number of things and the, an, an issue which is in the news right at the present time which uh, talking about Ebola and some of the emergency services. We're going to talk about that also. And last but not least is Nick Pirelli, uh, who is a volunteer. I met Nick when I was interim town manager. As I recall, he was driving around in that fancy little car doing a number of things on behalf of the department. But Nick is going to speak to us about the Community Emergency Response Team, or CERT. Gentlemen, welcome to Community Forum. Thank you, Joseph. Thank, Thank you. you. You know, uh, Chief, when I do a program, I always like to uh, add history and put everything in context, and that's just the way I like to begin to do it. And as I was reading uh, some of the history of the department, and as Tim and I were talking about earlier, really the conversation began in 1849, but the Stoughton Fire Department actually began somewhere in 1852, 1853. And what I add, and the first firehouse was in 1855 on Porter Street, and then the, that house was moved and became a residential um, uh, place somewhere up on Morton Street. But what I found striking is, you know, I think we overpay you guys now because the salaries back then were $2 a year is what the, uh, what the, what the firemen uh, received. But uh, in any event, we have to come forward with the times, and I'm glad that we're able to get such competence and pay for such competence here in the, uh, in the town of Stoughton. I'd like to begin, Chief, just to talk about what happens as far as and, and the impact of the budgetary process on the efforts of the department and to have you give a sense to our viewing audience the volume that department uh, undertakes in both emergency calls, both in terms of medical as well as uh, uh, fire deployment. So could you talk about that a little bit? Well, there's many aspects to the fire department. It's not just about uh, obviously responding to fires, which we do, but emergency medical issues, emergency management issues, uh, public education issues. Um, all those things come under the umbrella of the Stoughton Fire Department. Um, obviously, we, as far as emergency responses as a whole, we do approximately 5,600 responses uh, per year. Um, just to let the public know, uh, a lot of people think that number is skewed because they see multiple apparatus responding to a call. Uh, the way we track calls, one call, if it's one piece of apparatus, or 10 pieces of apparatus to respond to a call. It's still only considered one call. Uh, also, our emergency <coughs> medicals, we need to count them as part of that total number as well. We don't separate them. Although we do, do a large volume of our calls do involve the uh, ambulance service, which not only do they go to motor vehicle accidents, but also home medical issues. Uh, that's roughly about 26 to 2,800 emergency medical calls uh, last year. So it, there's very multiple things we educate. Uh, our education division, our fire prevention division goes out and serves the public uh, with educational things within the schools, uh, at the Council on Aging. We work with other agencies. Obviously that fire prevention division also works with the building department. 
per se on any new construction, any additions in town. We make sure the, they're compliant with the current codes to make it uh, safe for the residents as well as visitors to the community. So it's, it's we have undertake multiple issues uh, and, and what I find interesting, you know, it, it, and, and what I would find interesting, I would suspect that the majority of our viewing audience is just unfamiliar with other than maybe your emergency services aspects and fighting in terms of the fights. They probably don't know the other issues that you do. For mm -hmm. instance, when we had the, the occurrence with the fireworks. You know, again, the, you know, you have to oversee see those when there are large crowds, when people are having events, there needs to be uh, certain numbers. Uh, you need to have someone from the fire department in. You inspect whether folks are meeting their capacity limits. So there's a lot of different things that you do. And, you know, I don't think most people know that that occurs. Absolutely. Um, in fact, we might be doing a couple uh, surprise inspections, might we say, during this coming holiday season. We had discussions with the building department. We have a couple uh, restaurants that serve alcohol actually come with underneath our uh, scope and we want to keep an eye on them as far as overcrowding. It's funny you mentioned the 4th of July, uh, probably one of the largest unpopular decisions I've made as chief <laughs> uh, with having to stop those fireworks that night uh, due to the embers, the high winds, the fireworks weren't meeting their required height, so as a result, they were uh, deploying or igniting too early or going off too early, and the embers still in flames and s still hot embers were going into the crowd, and that was not a very popular decision that evening. I can uh, <laughs> I can tell you that it's, it took a lot of thought to go into that, but you have to uh, go to the side of caution, and you really have to keep an eye on the the public as a whole and how it might affect them. I'm going to just shift things around. I want to come to Tim and to uh, Nick as well, um, and I and we'll hold the Ebola dressing uh, towards the latter part of the program. But Tim, if you could just talk about under your ad, as the, the lieutenant for EMS, what exactly do you do? What do you oversee, and what type of deployment? So for my position, I'm new to this position within the past month. As a lieutenant of EMS, I pretty much handle everything that comes under the ambulance, from training the our guys to ordering supplies, making sure that, that ambulance is stocked, keeping up to date on things such as the Ebola outbreak that everyone's concerned about, which is a you know is a lot of preparedness on our end. So um, one thing is. The emergency medical services that we provide is second to none in the town of Stoughton. We have some of the best paramedics and EMTs in the state. I've worked throughout my career as a paramedic. I've worked everywhere from Quincy, Milton, um, Chelsea, Revere, Malden. I've worked for ambulance services throughout the state, throughout eastern Massachusetts. <coughs> Excuse me. And the paramedics that we have in the town of Stoughton are by far the best that I've worked with. It's great to to work with them and, and doing the training that I've done over the past month. These guys bring so much to the table. It's Can you talk about some of the training? Can you just just walk a person through sure. so what right. a training might be uh, for? Because there may be some persons who are watching this or they'll get on the phone and say, listen, you may want to become a paramedic. Uh, you need to... Uh, you know, to see this program. So sure. if you were walking mm -hmm. one through the process about the training, what, what would you say? So becoming a paramedic, first you, um, you become an EMT basic. As a basic EMT, you go to school for a six month <coughs> course and then you do some time in the hospital time. So for our audience, because they may not know what's an EMT, what, what an does EMT that stand basic, for? What, what, um, what does that stand for, yes. the, the acronym stand for? So that's your, your initial your initial intro class to emergency medical services where you can do anything from you're, you're working on an ambulance, you can handle basic first aid calls. So we go over CPR, um, handling broken bones, broken limbs, transporting criteria, transporting to the hospitals, which hospitals you transport to. 
uh, administration of aspirin, nitroglycerin, um, Narcan, and those in albuterol. Albuterol would be for asthma patients, Narcan would be for drug overdoses, and the other two medications, nitro and aspirin, would be for cardiac medications. That's what I want to make those sure folks didn't think we we're going to do nitroglycerin that we're blowing up the patient. Yeah. <laughs> those, are, those are the medications that fall under the umbrella of an EMT basic. After that course, you go on, you can work on an ambulance for a little while, make sure that it is the true career for you because it's not for everybody. Some now let me just stop you for yes, one sir. moment. What prerequisites would one have to have to go through the EMT? Uh, to, be, to, to become an emergency that is, medical technician. Um, that is your, your absolute intro to EMS. Okay, so you so don't you have to have any it. other uh, pre-qualifications no, in order to do that. High school graduate. Okay. So it would be like your, your first year of college. Mm -hmm. We're going to put it in that terms. Okay. So it would be like your first year of college. So you, you go out and it's highly suggested that you work on an ambulance for some time and make sure that the career suits you. After that, the paramedic school is a two-year in-classroom uh, program. After your in-classroom program, you, you go extremely in-depth into anatomy and physiology, how you're treating patients, um, medical aspects everywhere from cardiac problems to diabetics to um, hypertension, all criteria, medical overdoses, down to your trauma patients, multi-system traumas from your car accidents, from falls. So those patients will, um, I'm sorry, so after the, the classroom portion, which is two years, you go into your, your didactical, I'm sorry, your uh, clinical aspect, mm -hmm. where you, you go into a hospital, I believe it's 400 hours in the hospital, ranging from um, emergency room to surgery, to OB, where you, you actually have to witness three live births, and within those 300 hours. So if you haven't passed out onto the uh, yeah, uh, upper room floor by it. then, you're, you, you passed you're on to become an EMS. <laughs> so after those 400 hours, you move on to uh -huh. 100 hours in an ambulance, where you volunteer your time to ride third in an ambulance, and there is a, a laundry list of of skills that you have to exhibit that you know how to do on your own before you can work, before you can even sit for the state board exam. Well, wow. so, I mean, well, it's, it's a fairly involved training. I, yes. I, and again, I'm, I'm, uh, and thank you, Tim, for going through that because I would, again, I had no understanding of that at all. Um, and I'm certainly, most of our viewing audience didn't uh, at also. But let me uh, go over here to Nick. I know Nick has, is a volunteer, and I, uh, Nick, I just commend you for doing that, uh, uh, volunteering your time. And I, as I understand, you're going to be working on uh, establishing a community emergency response team or the CERT for Stoughton. Can That's you correct. tell us what, uh, what that will entail? Great, yeah. So uh, this is one of these programs that's actually been around for a while. And so uh, the, the concept's been around for a while. And it's a program from the Federal Emergency Management Agency. So as someone who's been in higher ed and an emergency management director in higher ed, I reached out to uh, the chief and we talked about some of our shared goals. And this was something that uh, he felt was needed and I thought would be a great addition and provide value to uh, the community of Stoughton. Um, so, like I said, it's a, it's a federal, uh, federal emergency management program that the town has adopted and what it entails is getting uh, citizens trained in uh, how to prepare themselves for emergencies, how to prepare their families for emergencies, and ultimately, once those two things are established, how can they come back to the community, to the Stoughton Fire Department, Stoughton Emergency Management, and be able to support emergency responders. Um, whether it's planning or logistics, um, whether it's in the emergency operations center and, and helping. Uh, there's a lot of different types of tasks and roles that trained, pre-trained citizens can be engaged in while the fire department, police department, DPW are focusing on operations. Let me tease this out a little bit. You, you, you know I'm <laughs> going to break it down into, right. uh, into small bites so we can do it. First, I want to be able to say uh, 
I just want to commend you for what you're doing working with the chief and the rest of the uh, fire department on trying to establish that. So I want to thank you on, as a citizen of the town. If a person was interested in becoming that emergent, assisting with the emergency response, how would they go about it? Who would they contact? What would they be expected to do? And if they have to have any pre-qualifications? That's a great question. I, and I think every citizen in, in Stoughton has um, talents that they can bring to the table. Um, I first would, would tell them to encourage them to visit our new website, stoughtonema.org, which is a, a great new website. I think it's a model for what uh, town emergency management agencies should strive to be. Could you repeat that again since That's we don't have www.stoughtonema.org. Thank you. Um, and when they visit that site, there's a link at the top that says get involved or volunteer. And on there, it kind of gives the basic information on what they really should expect. Um, but there's also an email address on there, cert at stoughton hyphen or dash ma.gov. And, uh, and, and that, but that email address is on there, and they can find that. And <clears throat> I think just reaching out to us first mm -hmm. and, um, and telling us what their interests are, because there are people that are 18 that can volunteer, and there's people that are 90 that can volunteer. There's anyone at any age can take on any different types of tasks that they, they wish to uh, be engaged with. Give an example of a few tasks that one sure, would have to Sure, absolutely. Take. So there might be someone that might want to uh, just be in our emergency operations center, which is at Station 2, Central Street. And um, we might need pe uh, people there to answer phones, um, to help out with logistical um, concerns that, that are going on, um, to help keep track of receipts, um, paperwork of people signing in and out of emergencies. Um, there's a lot of things that, again, when you think about the limited staff that uh, the fire and, and police department have, um, when there's big emergencies, whether it's a long-term uh, issue like an Ebola crisis or a um, uh, there could be uh, heat advisories that are out there where we have extended heat periods or extended cold periods. Um, there's a lot of tasks that have to be done. Uh, you know, I, I get another great example would be in the wintertime, we might have to open a heating center. Correct. And, you know, one of those things is, does it really make sense to staff it with a bunch of firefighters and police officers? The answer is no. You do, would you want to have one or two people there? Absolutely. But the rest can be staffed with pre-trained citizens of Stoughton. You know, these are people that have gone through training, that have been quarry checked, um, all those different things. And, um, and those are great ways for citizens to really give back to their community and be excited about helping their neighbors. I can uh, speak personally on at least when we had one of the storms chief, uh, I remember when I was interim town manager, we did exactly that. We were at the call center <coughs> at, at, on, uh, at Station 2 and were able to both the deployment of people who were couldn't get out or people needed shoveling or whatever, mm. we were able to do that. So I guess that would be an example of one uh, something that one could do. Is that correct, Chief? That's absolutely. Um, we don't have, we look at it this way, emergency response personnel are going to be busy doing the responses. If we have to monitor the power outages, for instance, we have to open a warming center during the, obviously the cold weather, if there's going to be an extended power outage. We need volunteers, we need bodies to help us do this. And we don't have enough, either police officers or firefighters. And for that matter, the public works, these are all the agencies that are responding to the issues that are happening on the streets. Yes. And that's not what the CERT team, that's not what we're looking for them to do. If we have an extended long-term power outage, we can actually team them up with Red Cross volunteers and deliver mm -hmm. water, food, to people that are stuck in their homes. We had that extended, I think it was Hurricane Gloria, we had like a 78 hour period without power to a area of Stoughton where it's mainly elderly. So Red Cross volunteers happened to come to town and they were delivering snacks and water to door to door to these areas of town, an area in West Stoughton. And what we're looking to do is make that more local. Mm -hmm. Let's have people with their involvement within the community help us accomplish those tasks and help accomplish them in a timely manner versus waiting for Red Cross volunteers. In fact, I met one of them, they came from Alabama. So that was 48 hours plus into the incident where maybe we can do something a little more on the proactive side mm -hmm. at an earlier time rather than have to wait for resources from outside the community. And, and, and to, to, uh, to, to kind of chime on that, you know, one of the big things is 
when there's large emergencies and there, um, you know, you have volunteers. Like, I mean, it's just natural. People out out of uh, the woodworks, they'll they'll come and and say they want to volunteer. What we're providing is we want them to do that, but we want them to be trained in advance because the last thing we want to have is a bunch of untrained volunteers coming forward that are overwhelming the limited emergency responders that we have. So actually the wonderful thing about this, this uh, that we're talking about this is we actually have a, a training that's happening uh, next Wednesday, October 29th, and it's going to be out, held at the library on Park Street from 6.30 to 9 p.m. And it's open to all Stoughton citizens uh, to come learn more about it and get basic trained so they can begin the process of becoming an engaged volunteer in emergency response in Stoughton. Well, it seems like not only on this particular program, Community Forum, but here at SMAC, we can put that information up, Chief, uh, about the class that's coming up and right. maybe do it on a continuing basis to encourage people to consider um, volunteering and coming out to get the CERT training. And I think the the station here could be of assistance to you on that, so we might That'd want to explore that on ways where we can keep that from a public service standpoint to have that discussion. But great stuff there, uh, Nick, and uh, hopefully uh, you are successful. We're coming on uh, the, the storm that we had uh, uh, recently would probably fit into that uh, <laughs> to that bill with all the rain outages and uh, and the tree limbs that were down. So I think that that's an example of if it's more intense, we're going to need more assistance for sure. Absolutely, Absolutely. a great example of the storm we just had for last night's storm and all the power outages. Uh, Nick and myself, mostly through Nick, I would send him all the notifications that I would get from National Grid and would post the areas that were without power. Um, and then before the storm was coming, we put out all the warnings, the flood warnings. Whenever MEMA sends out a message or NOAA sends out an emergency message or a notification as to any type of event taking place, we post it on our Facebook site. And last night, our Facebook site was fantastic. A lot of feedback from other people losing power in different areas. It was really uh, it was a great positive event from the term of emergency management and getting the information out to the residents and the feedback we got from the residents. It was a, it was a very positive event. Well, I will certainly look for that presentation from you at budget time at uh, town meeting uh, so that you can talk about all of these great things that the department does. Because I, I, quite frankly, I'm sitting here, you know, uh, somewhat um, better informed than many but not totally informed on all the different facets of the work that the department does, Chief. Well, it's interesting, this emergency management facet um, doesn't have a budget. But that's not amazing. Well, no well, that's why, you know, <laughs> we don't have I know a budget you didn't prompt that. me. I know <laughs> you didn't prompt me. I'm not prompting you for it. But what yeah. I'm saying is we need to address these issues. And if that's the case, I would say, you know, you know, maybe have a conversation with the town manager. We need to right. have that conversation in order to ensure that this is done. What, what you're talking about, well, as volunteer services, is as critical having sat at that command center and taken those calls from people and get the information from National Grid during those storms. It's important, and even going down to some places to see how it was happening. So, I, you know, hopefully you will bring that forward uh, I guess the budget discussions are going on as we speak, but uh, you know, I think it's important. Yeah, um, if I may add, he made his sound his job sound like it was so simple. So I just have to add something. <laughs> <laughs> he, <laughs> Thank you. His too. job is lieutenant in EMS. He has to stay on top of all the Department of Public Health notifications. He has to constantly deal with. We operate under a doctor's license. He's talk, which is our medical director. He's in constant contact with the medical medical director for any changes taking place in any regional or statewide protocol in how we operate out of the ambulance and what we do to treat people, any drug changes, any recalls of drugs. He actually reviews every single one of our transports. Last year there's just over 2,200 transports in the ambulance. He has to read and go through every report to make sure every all the I's are dotted, all the T's are crossed, and that the paramedics, when they deliver the, the, the emergency medicine that is done according to state protocol, and if not, he has to have a conversation with him. 
he's a very, very busy guy. And he just, when he was describing it, his <laughs> job, I'm just sitting here going, boy, <laughs> it's so much more than that. And I just wanted to add that to that. It's a very important yeah. function within the department. And uh, mm -hmm. we're, I'm, I'm very happy and actually very lucky to have someone such as himself in that position at this time. And, 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 and Chief, that demonstrates your leadership as well because, again, in order to effectuate some of the things that we're discussing today, we're going to need good folks like the lieutenant. But also, I would surmise that you need some additional hands, you need additional funds, you need additional things in which to do it. And I'm not sitting here trying to be a budget buster for the town, but if you want services, you're going to have to pay for them. And if you want good services, you want good people, you're going to have to pay them. So I'm going to ask you the question, Lieutenant. I mean, from the standpoint of what the chief described, beside what you described as far as what it takes to become uh, an EMS or, or EMT, uh, what we're talking about now is operationally. I, at the last time I recall, we have, what, two ambulances that we run uh, it, Correct. For, the, for the town? When you know, staffing, when we were able to do it staffing-wise. That's right, and, and I've been privy to all of those discussions, and that's why I'm raising them now. I'm going to ask you to tell our viewing audience, if you had, if we just said, fine, uh, Lieutenant Carroll, tell us what you would need and what you believe would give you the most optimum operation on the EMS Talk to our viewing audience and tell them what they would need, because those are the people who will be, ten words those of less, us who will be funding us. Okay, yes. well, I'll tell you, right now we, we run two ambulances during the day, Monday through Friday, and evenings and weekends we, if um, people are out on vacation or what have you, we will drop down to one ambulance. Um, to make this, for us to cover, I think it's 98% of our calls, Three ambulances would cover that. Is that correct, Chief? Pretty close. I, I would just guesstimate. I, I can't swear to it. It would be we would know we would have majority of them covered. Yeah. I mean that thirty ambulance wouldn't be as busy, obviously, as the first two, but we cross staff. This is one of the the, the big issues. Not unlike most smaller towns, your ambulance crew cross staffs to your ladder company. Well, when, when we're down to one ambulance. And that's a busy piece. Uh, that ambulance is busy almost all day. That ladder company gets taken out of the equation for a lot of responses. So we don't have a ladder company responding. And then you which, have to get the mutual aid from someone else to cover. Correct, which is a time delay. Yes. I mean, we still meet the NPA regulations or their, their recommendations as to having a first arriving apparatus within four minutes and the second arriving within eight minutes. But having a ladder company, especially fighting fires, we all know the fire volume is down. But what we have to focus on, as much as fighting fires and the number of fires are down, we have to realize that's a low frequency, high hazard event in the fire department. So it's a very dangerous event. So as a result, as many bodies as possible are needed to fully have all the functions needed on the fire ground and a ladder company to fully do their work. They do one third of fire grounds, or two, I'm sorry, two thirds of fire ground operations between ventilation, search and rescue, um, getting into a building, opening up a building as we call it. And majority of the time we do not have the staff to staff that ladder company, which equates into that second and third ambulance as well because they're cross staffed. Right. Well, again, I, you know, I think what, what we're highlighting here, um, and I want to speak to, the, to our viewing audience, what we're talking about here, budgetarily, what we're going to have to do is to make sure and ensure that there are sufficient resources for the department to operate. We may want these services, and uh, lo and behold, if something tragic does happen as a result of our not funding the department properly, we can sit here and say, woe is me, and we're seeing some of that in the national news now where we have a lot of woe is me comments going on because either the training that we are talking about, uh, Nick, the training that you've talked about, uh, Lieutenant, and also the training that you've talked about, Chief, is not taking place. And if you don't do the training, if you don't do the oversight, if you don't have to expend the dollars, you generally have poor results. And so we don't want that here in Stoughton with our fire department. So folks, 
this is a time for us to step up to the plate. We're coming to the budget season now. Let's, uh, let's do what we need to do. We talked about earlier that we wanted to uh, give the demonstration. The, the Ebola situation has, been, has dominated the news, and I'm sure our viewing audience has seen it over the past couple of weeks. And certainly we don't know if that might reach our shores here in uh, the town of Stoughton, but nonetheless, across the country because of the circumstance which occurred in, in Texas, everyone is talking about preparedness in that regard. So, Lieutenant, I know that we have a candidate that we're going to be uh, dressing up. He's, so, he's such a distinguished citizen of the town. We thought we would utilize him for the example of the appropriate and proper way in order to put on the, uh, the, uh, the protective gear. So you bring on our subjects uh, so we can do the Ebola demonstration. For those of you who may not know this distinguished gentleman sitting here, he is the producer of the Community Forum and the International Forum, and that is Mr. Roy Cohen, and that's who Lieutenant Carroll is going to perform the demonstration of how you put on the emergency equipment. So, Lieutenant? Okay, so this is our emergency equipment that we have in the ambulances as well as the fire engines. This is gonna be used for highly suspicious cases where patients are exhibiting flu-like symptoms and they just flew in from West Africa and we are going to take all precautions necessary to keep our staff safe and keep the community safe so we're not, we're not, uh, we're keeping the disease intact with one patient. So first we have a Tyvek suit. Uh, just to let the public know, the, all the dispatches in town have been given a set set of specific questions to be asked whenever a phone call comes in to dispatch. If there's anything, uh, any type of infectious disease question so that any of the first responders can be prepared before they go into the town, re uh, the residence. Uh, we also, the entire fire department was trained in these procedures approximately two weeks ago. Uh, majority of this follows the <coughs> CDC guidelines and also the Department of Public Health um, just to let you know, the Stoughton Fire Department, along with the Police Department, there are weekly briefings sponsored by Mass Emergency Management, the Department of Public Health, and also the CDC to do with any new developments of the Ebola virus and how it might affect us in our day-to-day -day operations and uh, the public at large. Uh, also, the Stoughton Fire Department, Lieutenant Carroll, along with uh, our captain, Bill Barkowski, who's part of our safety and training division. He also is a member of the state hazmat team, so he has a lot of experience putting on uh, exposure type suits. We'll be doing uh, a training for any of the town hall personnel that come into contact. Uh, or any of the town personnel that come into contact on a regular basis with the public, either through inspectional services or the public coming to them for help, uh, the visiting nurses, council on aging, uh, also the police department. We're doing a training at the community room tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Just so we're all on the same page and we're following the same procedures to try and keep everyone the public as a whole and also our working staff safe and secure. Typically the patients don't help you. <laughs> so this, <laughs> not only does this protect the patient, it protects everybody helping the patient. So in some cases, we put this on the patient, and in some case, in all cases, if it's a suspected patient, we would put it on the responders. Once again, we, there's a set, a set of questions. It was uh, put together by the Center for Disease Control out of Washington, and that's criteria we follow for asking the questions of whether or not this could be a potential victim of the, or carrier of the virus. 
I just have to say, uh, Roy has never looked better. He found his costume for Halloween. <laughs> Straighten on that. There we go. So our goal here is to have no skin exposure and to have multiple layers of protection on. Okay. Lieutenant, why don't you, once you finish that, step to the side and then explain to the viewing audience exactly what you've done here, what the intent is, and all of that. So Tyvek suits, first layer of protection for our our responders. Then we have N95 mask, goggles, and then face shield mask. This protects full facial coverage, full body coverage. Gloves with the uh, over gown over the gloves. We'd tape the gloves here so that we'd have no symptoms. So as you can see, our responders are covered from head to toe, and they're protected, which is our goal. Now, is this, uh, as was talked about um, in the news reports, when you have, this is what the responder would have on, as well as the, the, the patient? This is what the responder would have yeah, on. The, we go in, yeah. the mask, we put a mask on the patient, Yes. and we wrap the patient up. If we could put this on, we would. As you can see, I, yeah. there was a lot of contact right. putting this on, on him, yeah. and it covers the patient from any type of, of medical procedures we'd want to perform on him. Our, our life-saving procedures are, we're unable to perform on a patient here. So this is for us to treat the patient. Okay. So... And, the, uh, and that's something which is done in tandem with someone else yes. helping both so, with the uh, putting on of the emergency gear and similarly with the taking off of the emergency gear. That's correct. So our ambulance crew would be dressed like this. They'd be dressed by the lieutenant on scene as well as the engine company. That's why the engine company is there along with the ambulance crew to assist them with all aspects of patient care as well as getting prepared for patient care. Now, so when we do this, we'd also be dressed in the back of the ambulance. We have um, plastic drop cloths that would be protecting the back of our ambulance just ask you. so that uh, decon would be easier for the back of our ambulance because okay. we're going to have to decontaminate that ambulance if we do have a highly suspected case, which we don't anticipate, but we are well prepared for. Thank you. You anticipated my question. That was my next question was about the transporting vehicle and how that would be uh, decontaminated. Okay. Well, viewing audience, you now have an opportunity to see firsthand live on Stoughton Television uh, how you would handle uh, how the, the uh, an emergency response team would possibly handle a situation, or the EMS uh, a team would handle a situation if there was a Ebola or other type of scare. So, well, Lieutenant, Captain, uh, the Chief, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Roy, you have just elevated to the actor stage. I don't know, we have to increase your salary here at the program. So, what we're going to do right now as uh, we undress Roy here so he can go back to his other task. We're going to bring on uh, 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 announcements that have been made by Gary LaPierre. Hi, it's Gary LaPierre, and the crew wants to thank mm, 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 Maxie's Delicatessen. That's at 117 Sharon Street in Stoughton. They're 781-341-1662. American Cancer Society, yes, they're looking for volunteers, drive cancer patients to and from their treatments, 1-800-ACS-6662, or just go to www.cancer.org. Ilsa Marks Food Pantry in St. Anthony's Free Market, 2 Park Avenue in Stoughton. For more information, call Christine Gallagher, that's at 781-341-0611, or 781-341-0549. Meals on Wheels, just ask for Jessica. You'll find her at 781-344-8882, extension 2. Stoughton Penny Saver, our business is advertising your business, they tell us. 
27 Rose Glen Street, Stoughton, 781-344-4833. Community Forum Showtimes in Stoughton. It's Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday at 6 p.m. Monday at 8 p.m., Tuesday at 5 p.m. It's on Comcast Channel 9 and Verizon Channel 28. All comments and suggestions welcome. Contact us at communityforum1 at yahoo.com. Community Forum Showtimes in Easton. Mondays at 9 p.m., Tuesday at 8 a.m., Wednesdays 3 p.m., Saturday 10 a.m. And that too, Comcast Channel 9, Verizon Channel 22. Samaritans, they're at 41 West Street from the fourth floor in Boston, 02111. Their phone number is 617-536-2460. 24-hour helplines for Samaritans. And the number is 877-870-HOPE. That's 877-870-HOPE. 870-4673. Samaritans, you can find them at 800-252-TEEN. That's 252-8336. Or find them online at SamaritansHope.org. Support our Library Association, Inc. It's located at 84 Park Street in Stoughton. You can reach them by email at S-O-L-A Stoughton at gmail.com or by phone at 781-341-0856. Susical, the Little Theater of Stoughton presents Susical, the musical. You can purchase tickets to this event through their website, which is www.littletheaterofstoughton.org and you can purchase at Bob's Food Market and from cast members. The price for adults is $15, students and seniors $12, children under 10, and groups of 10 or more $10. The, the musical will be show, uh, shown on the December 12th through the 14th. It'll be at Stetson Hall, 6 South Main Street in Randolph. Their program times are Friday, December 12th at 7.30 p.m. Saturday, December 13th, there are two programs, uh, a matinee program at 2, 2 p.m., an evening program at 7.30 p.m., and a matinee program on Sunday, December 14th at 2 o'clock p.m. So rush out, get your tickets for Susico, the musical. Stoughton Emergency Management, help us help you. We talked about it on the program. We need folks to sign up to be trained to be emergency management uh, support to our police and fire department. They, you can, they're located at 1550 Central Street in Stoughton. If for more information, you can call 781-344-3170 or check the website at www.stoughtonema.org. You can also, if you're advanced, as some of you are, you can follow them on Twitter and Facebook at, at Stoughton EMA. Stoughton Fire Department, business number is 781-344-3170. However, in emergency, you want to dial 911. You can also check the website at www.stoughton-mass.gov. Well, we are back now and uh, we want to continue the program. I Hopefully you appreciated the work that the Lieutenant Carroll and, uh, did in dressing up our own Roy Cohen in the emergency gear. So Lieutenant, thank you very much for that demonstration and, and with the Chief giving us all of that commentary. I mean, I, I think we have to bring you back again. Uh, that was a good team uh, that we had going on there. So thank you very much for that enlightenment for all of us um, in our listening audience. Let's chat a little bit about, uh, let's bring it local. We, did, we looked at the national picture from the standpoint of things that may have an impact on us. We talked about the budgetary aspects here. Uh, we, we, we talked about exactly the work of the department chief. Let's chat a little bit about something which was near and dear to me when I was uh, interim town manager, and that was the condition in which our firemen and women had to do, uh, work under at Station One. And I understand that things are happening, and I'm pleased to hear that, but it seems to be a lot, a lot of time it has taken to get there in order to get work done on Station One. 
Why don't you update us? Well, fortunate enough, um, town meeting passed uh, a couple separate articles. Actually, it's been, the money is coming from three different articles uh, to be able to make some of the repairs in the living quarters upstairs, as well as some roof work, as well as repairing the floor on the first floor, the concrete uh, apparatus floor on the first floor where it was deteriorating. Um, actually, the tricky part of it has been is staying within the budget. I understand, you know, town meeting, they're very concerned about how much money they spend because we are in the process of having a study done in spatial needs done with an architecture firm out of uh, Cambridge uh, that won the award in the bid to do uh, a public safety building, combined public safety building, which I think is the absolute right direction for the town to go. Uh, we're in the process now of actually um, combining our dispatch, we're doing cross trainings, uh, people going for training to combine dispatch, we're going purchasing new software that goes along with the combined dispatch so that the Dispatch information will go directly to the fire truck since it will be done at the police station. Uh, so that's moving forward. So when you talk about but combined dispatch, you're talking about between police and fire. Correct. Right now, if you dial 911, right now it goes to the police station and then in turn they ring down to the fire station and the information gets passed. Now there's just going to be one single point of entry, which will be at a combined 911 dispatch center. Uh, we're hoping it may streamline the process and there'll be less missed information on calls. Because uh, every now and then, you know, when it gets real busy, because the police department's extremely busy, we're extremely busy, and sometimes, you know, not enough information gets passed along and this should help solve that problem. Well, we'll have a multi-agency uh, response and having all the response come out of one centralized location is just, uh, it's better for business. So we're looking forward to that happening. I'm sure we'll have a few uh, speed bumps in the road along the way because it is a change in the way we do business. But um, we're looking forward to working those out. And it seems to be the trend nationally. Um, for instance, uh, I think it's California only has six call centers for the entire state. Where Massachusetts has 351 towns, cities and towns, and I believe we have 351 answering <laughs> points. So uh, this combined dispatch, and there's a lot of regional dispatching uh, taking place at this time as well across the state. That's the dispatch, but as far as the repairs at the station, um, we're finally full steam ahead. We're getting new flooring put in. I mean, it's been the same flooring since 1969. We had worn out spots. I mean, you could, you could wash it all day long. It was still going to look dirty because it was just worn out. I mean, the living conditions were not the best. Well, I took that and tour. I feel I mean, as though you uh, took me no, on that tour. You absolutely. and uh, the captain at the time took me uh, on a tour of it, and I signed on to exactly and spoke in favor uh, almost two years ago uh, in order to have uh, work and funds allotted in order to make those conditions. Uh, M much more uh, appropriate for uh, our fire people, and so <coughs> again, I'm I'm happy to hear it's going. I'm I'm, I'm a little disappointed it's taken this long. Yeah. And hopefully, within the next sixty days, we'll have you for a tour so you can see it was. I done. definitely want to be. I want to be right there at, at doing it uh, because just like what you talked about today, the, the work that is done by the department is crucial, and certainly. The living accommodations, the working accommodation should be appropriate and, you know, yeah, I'm going to put it out there. Yes, we need to address it budgetarily. We need to make sure that these things happen uh, for sure. When do you anticipate that the combined uh, dispatch, that was something I think budgetarily was put in uh, about a year or so ago. When do you think that that may be up and running? It was actually approved and took place this July, July 1st of this year, this okay. new fiscal budget. Okay. Um, and the appropriations were made for the new <laughs> software for the build out of the call taking center over up at the, uh, over at the police station so they'll have to add a psap which is a answering point a 911 answering point and um, we have to cross train we're hoping best case scenario maybe in february march of next year because there's a they police dispatches have to learn how fire department operations work and then the fire department dispatches 
have to learn how police department operations work. And one of the things that the police department dispatches all go to the 911 Academy, it's called. It's a five week program. And Chief Shastney wants all our dispatches to go to that program before they come over to the police side of things to get a lot of that training under their belt. So that's what we have two dispatches that are in that right now. And then two more will be going in January. So as far as the total completion of that, we're hoping, and I don't, I don't believe construction has started over there yet, as of yet. I know they've looked over some designs, and then the purchase of the equipment, it does come from the state, some of the answering point anyways. Yes. The point of answering comes from the state. And then the other um, data terminals and such, that uh, has to come from our own funding, which, we, which was approved. So I, best case scenario, I think we're looking February, March of next year. So we'll see, we'll keep, keep plugging forward. Yeah, that. that's it. Question, I, you talked about the um, public safety building, and I know that's been a conversation that has been going on for a number of years, pre, you know, predated my arrival uh, and, and also is now after my arrival. Um, where, where, I know there were several sites that were discussed. Is there any site that's being looked at now as, as you go through the planning stages? There are multiple sites. We're, a, we're much more limited as the fire department in our response times and response miles as far as uh, the overall ISO rating for the town and what people pay towards their insurance rates. We don't want to be put somewhere where our response times will affect someone's homeowner's insurance. We want to stay at the uh, rating of three that we currently have. Um, we have a couple sites. I don't want to really speak publicly about them. Sure, uh, some, of them will, some of the sites are politically, uh, a couple of the sites are a little, uh, <laughs> you yeah, know, politically charged. That's a good way to put it. Um, so mm -hmm. a little controversial, we might say. So we do have a couple prime sites in mind mm -hmm. and uh, moving forward, I'm sure that'll come out. In, the, in due time. Yes. Just one, I want to give uh, both the lieutenant and Nick a, an opportunity as we come to the closing minutes of the program just to be able to, you know, underscore some of the things that you talked about. I'm going to start with you, Nick. We've given the lieutenant enough show time. He had an opportunity <laughs> to put on that suit. But I, would, I really think what you do, one, as a volunteer and, and what you're doing in emergency management is so important. So I want to give you a time to put that plug in once again for the work that you're doing so that we can boost those numbers of persons who may come out. So let me give you a moment here. Now. Thanks. Uh, again, I, I think the best thing that people can do is be educated uh, and be connected. Uh, so, you know, understand the resources that are in Stoughton right now. So uh, if you have, if you're on social media and you have Facebook and Twitter, connect with us on StoughtonEMA.org. Uh, bookmark the StoughtonEMA.org website, uh, which is great resources on how to prepare yourself, your family, and how to volunteer for the community. Um, there's really amazing resources on there, um, and it's, it's optimized for, uh, for mobile devices, especially which is helpful when the power is out and you're, you're relying on your handheld device uh, for, for information. Um, and then October 29th, you know, it's a great time to, to come together, uh, learn how to prepare your family, learn how to, to uh, prepare, uh, you know, your community, and, and ultimately prepare and, and respond to the town of Stoughton in times of need. And that's going to be the 29th at the, the library. What time? At 6.30 to 9. 6.30 to 9. I believe that's a Wednesday, uh, Wednesday evening. Yes, so sir. in terms of uh, want to encourage folks to come out. Lieutenant, you may have, well, I'm going to leave the chief with the last word, but I'm going to give you a few moments to uh, say. Yeah. That's right. So we obviously focused a little bit on Ebola today and infectious disease protocol. The chance of Ebola coming, uh, the chance of our department running into an Ebola patient is extremely slim. It's, it's a small, three small countries in the large co continent of Africa that there's an outbreak. There's no outbreak in the United States. Two nurses got infected by one gentleman. That one gentleman came in contact with hundreds of people and all, none of those people got the disease except for two nurses that were treating him at the end of his life when the disease is most contagious um well i'm going to do seasons among us yeah. well we're going to have thoughts. it but i'm not even going to be able to give the chief the last word because <laughs> my producer and my camera people tell me that i'm running out of time 
What I want to do though, Chief, I want to thank you, Lieutenant, Nick, I want to thank you for all that you do. Thank you for being on the program, and we may have to do this again, Chief. Thank you for having us. All right. There's always things happening at the fire station.